Okay guys, so Shonen Jump actually came out early this week for some reason. They usually come out on Sundays, as you know, but for some reason they came out today on a Friday as I'm recording this. And honestly, now that we actually have the chapter 306 for Black Clover out officially, reading the chapter and getting to see exactly what happens during the big moment of the chapter is completely different from the context that I originally thought from seeing the leaks when they came out on Wednesday. Because originally I kind of thought the whole moment with Xenon and his friend, I'm not going to mention that, we'll get into it later on in the video. But that big moment that you all obviously know about if you read the chapter, I thought from seeing the original images without any translation to them played out in a completely different context than what we got from this chapter with the official release. Anyway, jumping right into the chapter, we started off with, you know, charging up his shot and firing his arrow directly at Xenon. And I mentioned in my last review that I thought the only way you know would be able to hit him would be to fire directly through Langris as well because he was jumping in the way of the two of them at the end of the last chapter. And I was so sure that the bottle would actually have to come up with some kind of like creative way as to explain why Langris didn't die from getting hit with the attack, but Xenon did take some damage from it. And honestly, I thought that maybe, hey, he'd come up with the idea that Yuno's attack only targets people that he actually sees as an enemy and doesn't affect people that he sees as an ally or friend. Kind of like how, and I used this example in my last review as well, kind of like how when Goku charged up that spirit bomb against Vegeta, he made that spirit bomb specifically to affect people who had evil in their heart. That's why Krillin and Gohan were unaffected by it. Or even maybe that Langris would use the spatial magic to transfer the attack from hitting him and only hitting Xenon. But no, instead Tabata decides to just go with shooting directly over Langris' shoulder. Which honestly, I didn't even consider as being a possibility, but it's something that's so simple that I should have thought of that first. Anyway, the attack hits and it actually manages to drill a hole directly through Xenon's chest, which catches him off guard because of the fact that it was actually fast enough to bypass his defenses. Which is actually a callback to the first time the two of them fought, back when Yuno actually tried to defeat Xenon the first time, but he couldn't actually bypass his bonus defenses because they were regenerating faster than he could attack. Then we get the biggest surprise of this chapter, where we actually get to see a flashback going into Xenon's childhood, which is honestly something that I did not think we would ever get for any of the members of the Dark Triad. And I mean, we've obviously had flashbacks for Vonica when it came to her fighting off against Aesir, and I believe we actually might have had at least one flashback for Dante. But none of the flashbacks that we had for either of the Dark Tribe members went into this much detail about their past as compared to the one that we're getting for Xenon in this chapter. And we actually end up finding out from this flashback that apparently when Xenon was a kid, he was actually pretty much spot on the exact same as Yuno. And it's kind of like this entire chapter is pretty much just Yuno's backstory if it went a darker way. Because we see that as a kid, Xenon was often bullied by other kids in the Spade Kingdom because they found his bone magic to be creepy. And we also get to see younger versions of Dante and Monica in this chapter, and they're actually making fun of Xenon because of the fact that he's often being beat up by the other kids because of his magic. But you would think they actually would have a little bit more sympathy for their brother, considering the fact that they also have very weird and kind of creepy magic that other people must have picked on them for when they were Xenon's age. So it's honestly kind of fucked up to see the dynamic that these two have with their youngest brother. Which, by the way, I guess this confirms that Xenon is officially the youngest of the three. I wasn't sure exactly if he was older or younger than Vonica, because I don't remember ever seeing a scene where she calls him Nichan or he says something like that to her. But yeah, I guess this flashback actually officially confirms that he is the youngest of the three siblings. And actually, we end up finding out that it's not three siblings, it's four. Because during the flashback, in the same scene where we get to see the younger versions of Dante and Vonica, we get introduced to their older brother, who is a wheelchair-bound man, who throughout the entire flashback, we don't actually ever get to see his face. Now, during the scene when he's interacting with Xenon, he actually tells him that he should actually be happy, because of the fact that he actually has, just like him, the highest capacity or the highest potential to be a devil possessed, even more so than Dante and Vonica combined. And that one line alone actually makes it make sense why Xenon is the final fight out of the three Dark Tribe members that we're getting to see. Because I figured that since Dante had Lucifer, which is considered to be the big threat of this entire arc, it would make more sense for him to be the final fight that we actually deal with when it comes to the Dark Triad. But instead, he was the first, then we got Vonica, and now we're dealing with Xenon and his devil. And getting this line from their older brother, where he tells Xenon that he actually has the highest potential of a devil possessed out of the three of them, makes more sense, especially when we have the context of what happens at the very end of the chapter. And also sets up Xenon being the same level of threat in the next few chapters of this fight that Megakua was in these past few chapters that we dealt with her fighting up against Noelle. Now, as the flashback continues, we actually get to see the scene that she immediately makes people think of the comparison between Xenon and Yuno, because as he's being bullied by a bunch of kids, we see him immediately get saved by this other kid named Alan, who is the spitting image of Asta 
from when he was around the same age as they are in this flashback. And I will say they're probably around like between six and ten years old at this point. And you can tell that this sequence of Alan, Steven, Xenon, the two of them becoming friends and him inspiring Xenon to pursue the goal of becoming the head of the Magic Defense Force or the Space Kingdom, which is basically their equivalent to Magic Knights, is supposed to mirror the beginning of the series where we actually get to see the flashback to Asta saving Yuno from that adult who was abusing him and basically Asta inspiring Yuno to pursue the goal of becoming the Wizard King or as I prefer to call it, as the original fan translations used to call it back in the day, the Magic Emperor. So yeah, obviously at this point, fans are drawing a lot of comparisons to Yuno and Xenon. I mean, they have the same kind of stoic expression as kids, and we actually get to see that just like how Yuno was loved by Mana, and that's the reason why he was so gifted as a mage when they were kids, Xenon has the highest potential to be a devil possessed, so you know, the comparisons there between the two of them. And then after the two of them become friends and declare each other to be their rivals, we get to see this sequence of events or this montage of the two of them training to learn how to use our magic in proper ways and then eventually joining the Magic Defense Force. Now during the sequence, we actually do get to see a scene, and I think this actually is a very important scene, where Xenon actually goes to his eldest brother and tells him that he no longer wants to go down the path of becoming a devil possessed. And the reason why I say that this scene is actually very important is because of the fact that their first mission, or the first mission we get to see them on, is the two of them actually being sent to investigate a dungeon that appeared. And when their squad actually goes to investigate it, they actually end up finding a low class devil sealed inside. Now, what I think is that because of the fact that this was a new dungeon that appeared, and we had that scene that specifically showed Z9 going to his brother and telling him that he doesn't want to be a devil possessed, I think that potentially his brother set this entire thing up. That maybe his brother made the dungeon appear, and he actually had a devil placed in there using his connection to his own devil. That was set there as a trap to basically force Xenon into seeing exactly how strong devils are compared to humans and forcing him to rejoin a family after turning his back on it. Now, during their battle with the devil, a lot of their squad members actually end up dying. And Xenon realizes that the only way for him to put down the devil and protect the rest of his squad members who are still alive is to basically use his strongest attack and pour all of his mana into it in order to kill the devil in one strike. But he realizes that his attack is too slow and by the time he actually manages to draw it out, the devil will be able to dodge it or counterattack. And this is the part of the flashback that when I actually saw the leaked images that came out on Wednesday, I got a completely different context for than when the actual chapter came out. Because in the leaked images, I had originally thought that Alan actually came up with a plan where he would actually charge and distract the devil and Xenon would shoot through him and kill them both. Basically him sacrificing himself. But what we end up finding out from the official release of the chapter is that Alan actually charged the devil intending to kill it himself. And Xenon seeing the opportunity, and by the way I want to mention that it's not like Xenon intentionally tried to do this in order to get rid of Alan like he hated him or wanted to kill him. He really lamented over this choice, but seeing the opportunity and realizing that by using Alan as a way to distract the devil in order to land the attack on him, he decided to shoot his bone magic through Alan into the devil killing them both. Because he knew that doing this would be the only way to actually land the killing blow on the devil and making sure that no one else had to die. Now, I don't think we actually ever had a scene like this similar with Asta and Yuno, where Yuno actually had the choice of shooting through Asta to kill his opponent, or basically deciding not to. But I do think the reason why Tabata set up the idea of Langris jumping between Yuno and Xenon and having Yuno you know, shoot over Langris' shoulder was meant to parallel the situation. But yeah, ending in the flashback, obviously traumatized by having to kill his best friend in order to protect everyone else. Xenon decides to go back down that darker path and he goes directly back to his brother again. I believe he set this entire thing up, including the idea of killing off Alan, you know, getting rid of the one guiding light that Xenon had in his life that directed him away from the family. We see Xenon go back to his brother and tell him, hey, listen, I want to be a devil possessed. And then we cut back to the present day where we can see Xenon in his kind of like inner world where he talks to his devil and he tells him that he wants to make a deal. And we finally get a reveal, finally, I've been complaining about the fact that we hadn't known this for the longest time now, but we finally get a reveal what Xenon's Devil's name is, and it turns out that he is Devil is actually Beezlebub. Now, if I had to guess what kind of deal that Xenon's going to make with Beezlebub, I would imagine that since we now know it's possible for a human to be turned into a Devil, as we saw with Mekikula turning Lord Pachika into a Devil, I would imagine that Xenon's going to make a deal with Xenon, or with Beezlebub, by offering up part of his body or his soul or something like that in exchange for more power, turning him into a more demon-human hybrid. Which I can imagine is going to be on the same power level as Megakua was when she was only a third manifested in the human world. 
or maybe a little bit more powerful. That way Xenon actually ends up being a credible threat on the same level and it forces you know to actually evolve into possibly a saint form. But yeah guys, that's pretty much it for the chapter. That's it for the review. Thanks for watching. I really do hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please drop me a like and subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it. Comment down below your thoughts and theories. Alan is not Asa's dad and I'll catch you guys later. Peace.